we're going to welcome Dr. To Tai Chong, who is um, a fellow senior lecturer at the College of Alice and Peter Tan, NUS, and co-founder of Singapore Reef. So I first got to know Tai Chong in graduate school in NUS, and he was an amazing teacher back then, and now is an amazing uh, lecturer at, at, at CAPT. And CAPT is uh, big on community engagement, and that is where I think uh, uh, Tai Chong represents and uh, co-founded our Singapore Reefs, which is a community uh, organized uh, group that does work for uh, the reefs in Singapore. I'll let him tell you more about it in his talk. So um, everyone is uh, welcome to put in your questions during the talk. And uh, most of you are muted, which is great. So Tai Chong, could you please share the screen and please take over. Okay. So uh, some quick fun facts, right, about um, Marcus. Uh, so he has been a poster boy. So there was one point of time where the entire university was just full of his faces uh, at the side of lampposts and all that for publicity. <laughs> so, uh, so he's basically literally the poster boy of NUS when we were in graduate school. Uh, so it's nice to have him back uh, here, back in Singapore. I think uh, one great thing about COVID is that, yay, we get to meet up with uh, friends we haven't seen for a long time. Uh, and also to a uh, shout out to Kanan, um, his, you should really let him show you his amazing series of Young Scientist card, which is literally in mint condition. Uh, so yes, after this, you can ask him to show you, okay? Uh, so today, I think uh, I want to keep this a little bit casual. Uh, I have two promises for you, okay? Like in like GE, like that. Huh? So we'll give you two promises. Uh, so first of all, my first promise to you is that I will want to bring you on a virtual dive. Uh, I've been wanting to do this for the longest time, uh, but I've never got down to doing this. Uh, but finally, yes, I've got the chance to do it. So that's first. Uh, and the second thing that I wanted to also share with you um, is basically the answer to why I put the title as the puffer fish, the tub, and the card. So I'll review more about that. Uh, later on. So but what, I, what I need you to do here is this. Uh, so while you're listening, right, I will ask questions. Then if you can, uh, I'm, I'm opening my chat box already so I can actually see your responses. So respond, okay? So you, this is probably one of those that you really need to choke on. Uh, so you need to do some work uh, while you're listening to talk. Okay, let's go. Uh, so I wanted to you to um, see what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, really for those who are who have re really wanted to see the underwater world but never got a chance to because you haven't got your diving license or certification uh, and also for those who are already seasoned divers there are a couple of us here to actually uh, reminiscence about you know the underwater world because we kind of like miss it for the last couple of months uh, so just imagine that you are with me on a dive trip now okay i'm your dive guide for today uh what i wanted you to see here is that uh Diving in itself, right, most of the time people consider it as, oh, it's an extreme sport, you see a net joe, you need to be like super good at swimming. Uh, actually, you don't need to be fantastic. You know, you need to know how to swim, but don't need to be fantastic swimmers. Uh, but what I wanted you to see here is to know a bit more about diving, Singapore's uh, water, how it's like, um, and to get you to under appreciate a bit more about what we have underneath our waters, okay? So let's go. So for those who haven't seen um, the reef before, this is like a really nice picture drawn by one of our colleagues, Yu Chie. Um, so this is typically how a reef would look like. All right. So you basically get a reef flat region at the top, a lot of corals, and then it goes sloping downwards. Um, I must qualify that today a lot of the pictures and the videos I've have are not just mine. It's actually pulled from different sources. Uh, one that you will see recurring is basically from the Private Lives book, which I will share with you a little bit later towards the end. Okay, so let's start. Uh, so this is a great picture by Pei Yen. This is probably one of the uh, most awesome pictures I've seen uh, taken from a drone. So Pei Yen took this picture of Sisters Island. Uh, so if you go check out the story of Sisters Island, it's about a big sister and a small sister, right? Um, and then the islands came up from there. So, uh, but this is also one of uh, the most significant milestones of Singapore. Uh, this is where our first marine park is. About, right? So yes, it looks like a manta ray. Okay, so now let's start going underwater. Okay, so imagine that now you are, wow, you reach your dive site already. Some uh, Singapore waters are generally quite calm, as except for during inter monsoon periods. Um, so, but generally we actually get very calm waters because we are surrounded by many big islands uh, in Indonesia as well as the uh, Malaysia Peninsula. So 
diving in many um, areas, you, you tend to think of it as a very individualistic thing, but actually the diving community is very tightly knit. Uh, we are, I always consider diving as a team sport, uh, really because you really need to keep an eye for one another. But at the same time, right, you really need to be uh, first competent yourself. So you can see, this is what we do all the time. You get like groups of strangers, uh, before a dive trip, you don't know anybody, very shy. Then when on the, at the end of the trip, right, you're like best buddies that you've ever met. So this is the kind of time that we actually spend together. And a lot of people who are into diving always miss this social interaction. So this is what we really, really miss uh, of all this. So in Singapore, uh, most people would think that, why? You know, the Milo chocolate water, uh, what do you have underneath? Uh, so this is one scene taken off uh, in one of the sites of Singapore. As you can see, it's very nicely covered with corals, a lot of different species, again, the kind of diversity that you have. Um, in fact, uh, there are some sites that actually have comparable coral cover as uh, some parts of Tioman, right? So, you know, Tioman is a very touristy place, right? So, this is one of the places. It's, it's quite comparable. Um, we are looking at about 30 to 40% coral cover, meaning that every 10 meters, right, uh, you will have like three meters worth of coral. And that's fantastic. Uh, we always think that, wow, the coral Singapore could die. Uh, but, you know, they survive. They are, they are really, really, really very strong. After years of uh, sedimented waters, they still survive. So you really have to give it to them. So Singapore's water, um, for those who are not familiar with corals, uh, some of them can actually grow up to a human size. So this is what you can see here. Um, it's estimated that Singapore's reef is about 4,000 years old. Like 4,000. Uh, so they did this by coring, uh, and they found out, so they basically do uh, dating, you know, like, so dating, like, to find out the date, uh, not the boy-girl dating, <laughs> uh, dating uh, so dating, right, so dates back about 4,000 years, so not too bad, you know, actually we have a very rich history, you know, uh, even longer than the bicentennial and whatnot that we have. Um, and I wanted to you to actually see how it's like underwater, so this is, uh, not really a reef, but it's one of the sites that we frequently visit. Uh, and then I hope this video will not lag. Ah, fingers crossed. So I hope that you you feel like you're underwater now. You can do the Darth Vader breathing. <sighs> So the corals in itself, they are very, very diverse. Um, this is one of the star coral, gal galaxy coral that you typically can see. These are very pretty, um, but very ferocious. They have this thing like, like a ten very long stinging tentacles and they will actually sting whichever coral that is near them. Uh, so very pretty, but very deadly. Yeah. Okay. And then if you actually happen to come across this, these are corals of the same species. These are... Very ironic, they are, they are actually hard, but they're called soft corals. Uh, so yes. Um, and if you actually come across this, this is a very interesting phenomenon. You only get to see this once a year in Singapore's water. Um, so you, and you see this in the daytime. So do you all know what they are doing? Like, what's the significance of this white fluffy thing? Feel free to type in the check, check box. Huh? Yes, mating. Well, very good. Uh, dendruff. Uh, cannot be dendruff. Nah. But mating, yes, mating is spawning. Uh, so in this particular case, right, this is what we call uh, brooding. So basically, they put their eggs right out on their tentacles. And if you zoom in, right, this is what you see. So pretty. Uh, what you can see is little, little flowers with their, uh, their larvae attached at the top. And then after over a period of time in a day, about half an hour or so, they'll start releasing these little babies out. Uh, it happens in Singapore's water. Typically about, I think we last seen them in uh, April, May. So pretty, right? So then as you swim across the reef, you start to see weird structures like this. Obviously, if you look at the bottom, it doesn't look natural. Um, this is what we call a coral nursery. In Singapore, we've been doing it since 1990s. Uh, and we've been getting quite a good hand on, handle on this. Uh, the corals can grow up to uh, about 1.5 meters just on... And this is like, we just placed it there and then it just started growing. And then within one and a half years, it grew to about 1.5 meters. So this is amazing. And then the most 
uh, um, awesome thing about Singapore's coral reef is that if you actually zoom in, right, you see a lot of little critters. Uh, so this is what we call a guard crab, right? So this is really like the defender of the corals, right? So basically anything that comes and try to eat a coral, they'll just push it away, snap, snap, snip, snip. Uh, and you start to chase this uh, through predators out. Um, and, but of course, at the same time, you need to get something in return, uh, right? So they'll start consuming all the little mucus that the corals give out. Uh, and then, can you all guess what is this? We also find this in corals. We, I've seen this many times, uh, especially in the nurseries. Uh, we fish ball. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Samuel. Uh, cuttlefish egg. Fantastic. Yeah, so cuttlefish egg. Um, so what we have done is that on one occasion, right, Futo, <laughs> one of the <laughs> occasions we brought this up, we reared them in the aquarium. And then this is what I would like to introduce to you Sandy. So he hatched. All right. So an uh, honor student were, was actually just, you know, going out with us looking for critters and came across this. So he hatched and eventually we released it back into the ocean because we don't know what to feed it with. <laughs> so we like, hey, better not keep it for too long. And of course, we also get a lot of uh, pretty animals that we're quite familiar with, clownfish, for example. Um, and there are pl plenty of this around in our waters. So uh, mind you, so far, all the pictures and the footages are taken in Singapore waters. Uh, so it's not as um, murky as uh, we most of us would think eh, it is. Um, and occasionally, you get little uh, smaller stuff like this. So this is the anemone strip, right? So you can see, munch, 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 munch. All right, so graceful. Um, a lot of the aquarists like to catch these um, streams and try to put it into their aquarium tanks. But I'll try not to because it's, uh, they, they don't survive very well outside. Uh, they, they, they are very wild animals. Lah. They'll find their way to survive. Okay, So let's try not to keep some of this. And I want to introduce to you these cute little bunnies. Uh, a lot of people call these sea bunnies or sea rabbits. Uh, so this is also one of the nudibranchs. So these are nudibranchs, commonly also known as sea slugs. Uh, so basically like snails without shells, right? So they are sea snails, sea slugs. Um, what is very interesting, think of them as raving rabbits, okay? Very cute, very cute, but then they can, they actually have a lot of uh, protection. Uh, so like, for example, they feed on like soft corals and soft corals, you know, they, sometimes they sting. So these guys, right, they will just put all the stinging cells and attach it to their body like a, like a, like a add-on, you know, weapon. Uh, and then when animals try to come close and try to eat it, uh, it becomes very unpalatable. Yeah. So it's so cute, right? Uh, and these are all found. There are many, many types. Uh, I've, and if you look at the private lives book, there'll be a lot more uh, that you can actually see. Uh, so a lot of them also try to mimic their colors so that they look like um, soft coral, so that it makes it look very unpalatable. So very smart creatures, uh, very small, very fancy. This is one of those that divers really love because they're just so cute. Okay. Uh, and then, okay, now this, this is a picture of a cardinal fish. Can you all see what's inside the mouth? <laughs> More fish balls. Babies. Yeah, so babies, right? So you can see, is, so, so um, Peiyan took this picture, really nice picture. Uh, that you can actually see the little babies in the center. Um, so like many other animals, uh, the other uh, ones, for example, seahorses, we also have quite a number that... Uh, that we can find here locally within Singapore waters. Um, so more dangerous animals. So you have snakes on land. You also have snakes in water. So this is a banded sea crate, right? So um, known for its venomous bite. Uh, but in actual fact, right, as you actually go near them, they will swim away. They are really very, very shy. Yes, dangerous. Um, so try not to go too near. Uh, admire them from far. They are usually very shy. So don't corner them into uh, their, a corner and uh, try not to agitate them too much. Yeah. So the, venomous, the venom is really to help them hunt. Uh, it's not meant to attack humans, but if you, like any wild animal, if you go too close, they'll bite. Okay, and of course, another one that we also see, uh, stonefish, right? So as you can see here, so Maiden took this picture. Um, you can see it's very well camouflaged. So it really depends on where you find them. Uh, in the more rocky shores, you get them a, little, a lot more brownish. So in this case, you actually get a lot more, this is a fairly white one uh, because of its background. So it's 
their master camouflage also quite uh, also venomous because of its thing. Uh, some countries actually eat stonefish, like they cook and destroy the venom first, then they eat the flesh. Uh, but not very common here in Singapore. Uh, so do look out on some of these animals. And the first main character for today, uh, so that's the pufferfish. I don't have a picture of the pufferfish that I saw, but I just wanted to share a story. Um, there was this particular dive that I saw this animal. Um, so majestic. Uh, it's quite, quite big. It's about um, 50 cent centimeters from head to tail. Um, and it basically just so cute. It's like it moves so slowly and then it just looks so blur. Uh, and this is the inspiration for today's talk. Uh, because what was very depressing at the same time when I was looking at it, it was so cute, but then it was sleeping inside a plastic tub. So, you know, it's so ironic because these animals belong in the wild, but they sleep in the plastic tub. So as you actually swim across Singapore's water, um, we don't see it on the surface. Okay, sometimes we do, right? But actually underwater, this is what you see most of the time. Bottles, right? Plastic tubs, bottles. We once uh, dived and found out, found like uh, about 2.5 liter jiang yu, a soy sauce, dark soy sauce. Um, and it's like practically unopened. So somebody probably dropped it into our water somehow uh, and then you scoop it up. So bottles and all that is very common. Uh, it's at the same time, very damaging. Uh, in Singapore, it's very hard to spot them because they're all covered with a lot of sand and a lot of marine organisms. Uh, and then you also get things like this. So boat batteries, uh, if this is what you're looking at, um, basically when ships, ships do go aground in Singapore, um, and then when they hire the salvage companies to salvage, they will, the contracts say, okay, salvage the hull, then they will just bring up the boat body and then the rest of the parts just get dumped there. So it's very sad. This whole thing was really heavy to remove. Um, I think it was a good 10 kg. Uh, including from the battery, these are boat batteries, and then together with the wires. Uh, so it took like about three or two or three of us to actually bring all of this up uh, as we dive in Singapore's water. Uh, and then this one is quite obvious, right? Uh, bicycle wheel. Uh, I think we've collected enough to actually assemble a mountain bike. We just need like, so we found the seat, we just need one more wheel. Yeah, we found the seat, we found the, the, the main part of the body. I don't know what's that called, but the, the main part, and then we found one rear wheel. Uh, so these are the things that we actually find in the water. It's very, very odd. Okay, so then uh, any guesses what are these? Mastins, yeah, mastins. And, and it's just not one, two, or three, you know. We found, I think we, told, we picked up about 40, 30, 40? Of this in one location. We don't know what happened. It just happened in the same spot. So it probably like somebody cooked it, then they, I, I don't know what to do with it, it just throw. Or it could be like, um, you know, rubbish or some stuff that just got thrown over. But these are the very odd things that we see. Mess tins. Okay. Uh, things that are used for camping, but we found it in our waters as well. Uh, I'd like to sh show people this video. Okay. So make a guess huh, as you look at this. Okay. Make a guess and see what you can see from here. Okay. So, Yes, washing machine, fantastic. Washing machine, oh, washing machine out in our water cannot be la. What I mean, you tell me, mastins you throw out, but washing machines, a bit hard, right? To, <laughs> right. So this is uh, we we haven't brought this up yet because it's really too heavy. Uh, I think we estimate this is about uh, six point five <laughs> kilograms. We don't know what to do with this, man. It's like it's been there. Ah, yeah, things that we find. Um, and of course, uh, if you on sunny days, you will need this. Uh, and somebody probably <laughs> lost it somehow. Okay, umbrellas. Uh, unusual things. Waterproof, yes, for sure, a waterproof. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also items like this, which are also very problematic because they move around. And our turtles often mistake this as jellyfish. Uh, I mean, I would love to show you another video of a jellyfish, but it really resembles that. So can you imagine, yeah, just moving around and then you see this, you think there is food, then... That's what happens. So um, 
as part of our Singapore reefs, we actually clean out uh, our reefs together, not just us, but a lot with a lot of uh, the local divers here in Singapore. There are a lot of very passionate people uh, that we have here. Um, and many of them are less than 40. So basically young adults, youths, there are many of them. The youngest that we ever brought out was 12. Right. So uh, that's how enthusiastic our local divers are. So you know how we don't like to pick up rubbish when we see them in the void deck? Uh, when you actually bring a group of divers on board, right? They love this. They, it's basically like treasure hunt. So you just go and hunt down all these things. And then these are the things that we can we take, we bring up. It's quite normal, uh, this amount. Um, and you get to really see firsthand the amount of stuff that you see underwater, right? So uh, just for size, this is Sam, um, uh, my friend and colleague, also co-founder of All Singapore Reefs. Uh, she's squatting there for size comparison. That's how big a tire we found. Yes, it's huge. And we got a scolding from the uh, book captain because uh, apparently you're uh, not supposed to bring up tires. Because if you bring up tires, somebody, somebody, uh, whoever bring up uh, must bring and recycle. But who wants to recycle this tire? I don't know. So this is uh, another story to tell. Uh, but the tire, the, these are like tractor tires, most commonly used for bump boats at the site. Like instead of bumpers, they use this. Um, but beyond all this trash, right, you actually get a lot of issues. Um, this year, uh, we actually see some of our corals bleaching. So sometimes you read about coral bleaching, right? So you will see what's happening here. And what is most problematic here is that they die after that. Just a couple of months after they start dying, uh, and it's very obvious, and it'll take like a couple of years before they actually grow back. And um, sometimes, you know, if you look at boats grounding, right, they don't just leave stuff there, they go straight into the huge coral that you probably were seen in the earlier part of the slides, and they crash into half, like this. Okay? And as you come up from the water, you see things like this. You know, at the background, you see the port development. Sometimes the contractors will actually leave sand and it will start floating all around. Imagine diving in such waters. So the, the question here is that, you know, as you go down to the dive, um, is this really what we want for Singapore's water? So I think that's the question that we want to pose here today. Lah, right? So I've shown you the puffer fish. I've shown you the tuck. And now I'll bring you to the cut. Okay, so the four of us have been working in uh, in various means. Uh, so at parallel to this, there's actually a talk going on by Sam, um, and she's going to talk to a whole group of people about this network that we actually joined. Uh, so to get different users together, so that we come together and think about solutions uh, and to ideate. So beyond just cleaning the reefs, which is supported by a whole group of people. Um, including dive operators, private companies, and also other NGOs and the government agencies. These are what we call, what, what I typically like to call a community effort because we really can't do this. The four of us cannot do this alone. The scientists cannot do this alone. We really have to bring together people to make this happen. It's just too much for us to do. So the idea here is that we pick out the trash and you really realize that we are, we're not, we are not being anal by lying them on the floor. Huh? We're actually lying them neatly so that we can count and upload onto database and share the data with the world. So in a lot of the things that we do, we engage our youths. Uh, the youths, I tell you these days, they are so passionate about volunteering. We get so many requests to actually help out and we are very thankful for all this. So we actually have very limited events because we are just a form person team and we have our own full-time jobs um, but they help us out every single step of the way to help us engage the people uh, sometimes we tie up with other organizations right so this is one of the seafood workshop uh, that we did so we bring in like seafood and teach people about marine animals that we can find um, and I would like to bring your attention to this book that you can actually get at the Lee Kong Chien National History Museum it's opening soon uh, this part a lot of the images are from this particular book uh, and by supporting this book, you are supporting a lot of the efforts that the local uh, marine groups are actually doing. So this particular book will show you a bit more about what Singapore's waters are. Uh, and in parallel, after this, all right, uh, you can actually uh, check out whether there's, there's a parallel talk by ADEX. ADEX has been supporting quite a lot of marine conservation groups also, especially in COVID times. They have been uh, launching a lot of webinars uh, to engage people. So I have two young girls. Uh, so these are not my girls, of, of course. Uh, these are one of the events that we've uh, adjusted. One of the things that um, we need to reach out to the young. And that's where I want to highlight about the card. So for some of you who are familiar with the Young Scientist card, right, that you didn't see, did see since young, uh, we had this idea last year uh, and we asked people to 
whether this is a feasible idea lah, because we don't have a marine biologist one, right? So shall we just do one? So uh, it was the, the committee was very supportive. Uh, and this was one of the things that uh, we launched just this year. So the Young Marine Biologist card, it's an uh, extension of, uh, it's one of those many series of the badges that you can actually get. So they are now online. Uh, so what we were very thankful for here is that we approached Science Center and they said yes. They said, wow. I didn't know they were expecting, I thought it would just be like shut down, but they're very welcoming and they really like the idea. So develop the questions. Uh, we got a primary school to help us try this out and then now it's finally launched. And the good thing is, right, it's now all online. So, and then we checked with Science Center, there is no age limit, right? So you, well, I always think that it's for primary school students, but it's actually not, you know, so you can go in, right, as an adult and then you sign up and do the activities. But of course, if you have niece and, you know, and nephews, bring them on board. Lah. Um, but, you know, you can do this yourself and try to collect the rest, all right? For Kanan who has lost all your badges, you can redo everything again, uh, right? So, yeah, but this is one of those that we have launched this year and we are very thankful that, again, a lot of people have been behind this. Even teachers, you know, from Academy of uh, Science uh, of uh, Singapore Teachers came to help out. It's really a huge group of people who have worked behind the scenes to make this happen. So, this is something that I'm very proud, I'm very, very proud of. So, but also, when I end off with this picture, um, it's taken at one of the events, but I think it encapsulates what uh, our Singapore reefs and what the community can do. The fact that conservation is really not something that we can do alone. Uh, if you're passionate about it, right, find some way to do it. One thing that I always tell uh, people, young adults and youth, please don't think that you don't have any skills. You should have a skill. Huh? If you can, you can manage social media, you're very good at Instagram, you've got influencer, there you go. You can help all these marine groups. We have plenty of them for you uh, to support. So just a little bit of effort, um, a bit of your time will help these little groups grow a long way. All right, that's all for today. I hope you enjoy the dive and you understand where the card comes from, okay? All right, thanks. Awesome. Thank you for the great talk, Kai Chong. I really enjoyed it, especially all the pictures of like the pictures and the videos of the dive because uh, I don't dive myself and it's really fun to look at all the stuff. And I think, yeah, I think you also raised a lot of awareness on like the kind of um, rubbish and like pollution we get in our local waters. So yeah, that was good. Uh, we've just got a couple of questions, so I'll just go through them because I, I don't know whether you like managed to catch them while uh, you were speaking. So... Uh, them here now in a moment yes so um right so uh azahari wants to know uh some ships are sunken deliberately to promote coral growth so mm -hmm. would these parts have similar effect like the parts that you picked up right which you said were actually pollution so mm -hmm. will they have a similar effect to those ships which are like deliberately sunk to provide uh, coral growth okay um i would say uh, this is a very contentious topic do you know that even People actually sink oil rigs, like the unused oil rigs. They will just bam. They, they, yeah, they want to convert it to reefs. Uh, it's pretty contentious. Um, but I would say that at a scale that we are looking at, right, the small little parts, it's unlikely to make a huge effort. Uh, if anything, right, I would think that the danger of the chemicals leaching out of the batteries is a lot more, uh, it out really outweighs the kind of um, positives that we actually see. Um, and also a lot of these metal parts, you, um, we, we shouldn't think of a metal, uh, boats as a, uh, as made up of just one material, uh, there is usually a composite. So do you really want metals rusting in the water and then leaching out? You know, yes, they, they provide a uh, substrate, but I would rather that we have rocks, you know, over artificial things anytime. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense, I guess, because I, I did think that like an uh, entire boat has like metal and plastic and not just mm. like one single material, so yeah. Uh, Nazira wants to know, how do you decide which debris you can bring up? Because some of them would have become homes for like marine life and stuff. Mm, very good question. Uh, one of the most common questions that we get from uh, our divers, um, one of the key thing here is that we actually, in our dives, we actually have a number of uh, fairly seasoned marine scientists helping out. So um, they are our guides. So what we usually do here is that we will pass it on to them to assess what animals are there. Um, there are some animals that are very common, like sponges, uh, some, some sponges, huh? some sponges and some uh, shellfishes. So um, you, those, if you think that, uh, if we assess that it's not um, rare, 
we will actually say that, okay, we can actually pluck them out, put them back somewhere else, and then after that, we pick up this reef. Um, but in other cases, if it's really colonized by, say, a huge coral already, what we'll do is that we just leave it there. Yeah, so it really depends. Um, so I think at the end of it, uh, to the, question, the answer to your question here is, uh, we really need to see what animals are there first, uh, and then determine what is best for that particular animal. So it's really on the spot, it's on the fly. So when we, whenever you get animals like this, the scientists will help to assess first before deciding. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. I guess that, that kind of makes sense as well. So I guess like your divers will have like a huge responsibility to like decide whether or not to move something, right? Mm. So yeah. I guess it's quite important. Mm. Uh, next, uh, Karen wants to know, is it possible to buy the book online? Uh, I think Private Lives. So yeah, Private Lives book. Is Marcus? it uh, available online? So the museum is trying to uh, figure out how to best uh, sell the books online, but it's currently not available online. You may try Kino. Uh, it's also sold at Kino, Kinokuniya. So you might try there. Uh, otherwise, uh, an easy way is just to head out to the museum uh, over, over the weekends to look for it. Mm. Right. Uh, I've got two more questions here, and then we'll <laughs> pass it over to Marcus. So um, first, uh, Desmond wants to know, when are the cleanup dives starting again? Oh. You know, this year, right, we actually planned for six, uh, but because of COVID, we had to cancel every single thing. Um, we've weighed out the benefits and the, and the costs. I, I think the risk is simply too high. Um, so not until um, this year, the, the chances of that happening quite low. Uh, we have to take cue from what the ministry says. But for now, I think the dives are really restricted to mostly... Um, scientific dives. Uh, recreational dives, there are some, uh, but for us, I think we are not resuming so early. But you can ke uh, keep a look on our Facebook and also Instagram. The moment we have uh, news, we will let you all know. We okay. can't, get, we can't wait to get into water as well. <laughs> uh, okay, um, Chia Hauki wants to know, what can we do to help prevent or stop uh, coral bleaching? Oh, wow. Um, this is one, probably one of the most complex things uh, that could ever happen. I think because, the, I mean, we need to first understand what the cause is. Uh, it's really about our temperatures in our water climbing higher and higher every year. Um, so I would say that the things that we need to do is the very same thing that we are doing to help mitigate climate change. Exactly linked because the seawater ri temperature rising, that is one of the impacts of climate change. Um, so the daily things, use less electricity, um, try not to waste any of these resources. Yeah. And then I think one thing that you can really do at home here is really to start within your own local community or even your families, try to pick up some of these habits. Um, so there's no um, fast solution to actually help uh, mitigate the problems of coral bleaching because the problem is very extensive. It happens on a global level. Yeah. So unless okay. you can have like a huge uh, freezer that changes the water temperature. Otherwise, it's tough. Okay, fair enough. Hmm. Um, right, I think, uh, okay, we will do, we'll do one more question. I know I said two more. We'll just do one last one and then we'll pass hmm. it to Marcus. Uh, Leo wants to know, do you collaborate or partner with any CO2 reduction projects? Mm, probably need more elaboration. I'm looking at this question as well. I'm not too sure if I've gotten it right. Uh, Leah, could you um, elaborate a bit more? CO2 reduction. Carbon offset. Is it carbon offset? Um, okay, so I'll just understand, uh, answer based on what I understand, okay? Uh, so for the moment, uh, or initiatives that work to reduce CO2 emissions, no, not at the moment. Uh, if you have ideas, can you please uh, drop us an email? I think we are, one thing that we always appreciate is people helping us and coming up with new solutions. Uh, one thing that we always believe is that everybody has their own expertise. So if you have new ideas on how to collaborate, we are happy to try out uh, any ideas that you have. So if let's say you have ideas for CO2, uh, reduction uh, schemes that you can that you could think and tie, off, tie in with uh, what the work that we are doing. Yeah, just drop us an email. Oh, excellent. Mm. Um, so that's all the questions from my side. Marcus? Okay. All right. So maybe I'll, we have one minute left. So maybe I would ask Tai Chong to I'll put him on the spot a little bit. Um, you're wearing this uh, red shirt or 
maroon shirt that has the letter C A P T uh, emblazed yeah. on it. Could you maybe tell our uh, participants like what is C A P T? What does it stand for? What does it do? Tell mm. you a bit. Okay, so. Um, in NUS, we have this thing called residential college. So students, it's like a hall, but you actually study within the place as well, um, in the hostel. So it, is this living inside a hostel, but at the same time learning? Um, so CAPT stands for College and Alice and Peter Tan, named after the great generous donors who actually supported all the undergraduates um, when it comes to the financing of uh, hostel stays. So in CAP, what we do, what, uh, our very strong focus is on uh, community engagement. So we actually will reach out to different groups. So, I mean, I work with the environmental groups. There are other of my colleagues who actually work with uh, more vulnerable groups in the society, uh, migrant workers, elderly, um, and even youth at risk. So there's a whole range. So I think students come in, learn a bit more about these social issues. Um, our standpoint here is that we are not going for service learning, but what uh, we are gunning for here is that to use um, the community uh, as a platform for us to learn. Uh, to basically come with a point of uh, learning and understanding a bit more about the struggles that they face. And hopefully with that, right, students get a better understanding of how different perspectives or different issues and make their own conclusions and be an enabler and change maker in the future. All right, that sounds mm. uh, superb. And I understand that there is a special course taught in CAPT called um, Environmental, environment and civil society. Yes. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, to me, it's one of the flagship modules of the of CAPT, and it, it teaches um, students how to engage with um, uh, decision makers uh, through mm. the and through environmental causes or through environmental issues. So mm. uh, people who are thinking of uh, enrolling in NUS, that's a place to look out for. Um, mm. All right. So uh, well, I'm gonna unmute everyone so that we could thank our speaker, uh, Dr. To Tai Chong, for his wonderful talk today and, and dive trip. So um, in three, two, one, I'm going to unmute everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tai Chong. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to mute everyone again. Um, we, in, for Chinese, uh, mm -hmm. Yep, uh, and then we're gonna move over to uh, the trivia session. So uh, we're gonna have, uh, uh, Kanan's gonna share his screen and we're gonna move on to instructions. Yes, we, of are. Yes, yes, we are. What's happen in the next 20 minutes? Share screen, share and present. Hello, all right, here we are. Um, okay. Cool. So, okay, so. Um, once again, this is the, yeah, the, the call for uh, tri trivia contribution. I think right before, uh, tri before the session, we only had $2 in our trivia pot. Uh, remember yeah. that every, every dollar you, do, you, you contribute uh, actually gets doubled or matched by the government. Uh, so it's a good time to uh, make a contribution as well. Right, and then um, if you've Got the other one, so you can go to your live Google Sheet and update your scores as you are playing, and also that's where you put your team name as well. Right. Yep. So, uh, quick briefing for uh, people who are joining us for the first time. So, this trivia session uh, consists of four rounds, including one bonus round, and today's theme is GRC. Yeah, riding on the uh, general election 2020 uh, tail coats. And so, if you are joining us for the game. Uh, update the uh, live Google Sheet that we have post pasted in the chat box. Put in your team name and your preferred beneficiary. So the winner of the trivia gets to decide where this, uh, the trivia pot go to, which, which uh, NGO or which environmental um, charity uh, gets the money. And we're going to follow an honor code. So you could play uh, alone, solo, or you could play with a team. Um, and the only thing is that there is uh, no looking out of answers. At the end of the trivia, yes, uh, we would wish that you send us an email with your answers, or you can take a photo of your answer if you write it down uh, and email it to us. That's how we check uh, that the winner is legitimate. All right, so um, let me take a look at the Google Live sheet. Let's see how's the action over there. Yeah. Oh, I see there's a team called Team Cockles Mike. Um, uh, Beneficiary is Acres. Uh, we've got quite a few. 
Okay, so Leah is asking, how do we join? Uh, I'm going to paste the Google Sheet tiny URL in the chat box. So just head over there, type in your team name and your preferred beneficiary. And we'll begin once uh, I see no more action in uh, the sheet. Meanwhile, get your uh, writing materials ready, or if you're going to open up a, a text editor, that's possible too. Yeah, for so first I'll, time people, sorry, sorry, Marcus. Uh, for the first time people, no, right? No, uh, no. There's no, there's no online place for you to like put your actual answers. So the online place is kind of like put your score and your team names. So just write your answers on like a piece of paper or put it on like a document or something, and then send it to us later, where we will look at it for like uh, reference purposes. So yeah. Yep, and then see we'll that, see that Nasri, Nasri is not here. So what's Team Sand Slash going to do? Yeah. So we're going to go through the answers uh, after we review all the questions, and there'll be a bonus round, which we'll get to in a bit. So I think I don't see any more uh, action on the on the Google Sheet. So I think we can begin. All right, let's go. So this week's theme is GRC. Of course, like I mentioned earlier, we are going to be riding the uh, the election wave for one last time. So let's go. And G stands for carbology. Carbology is the study of garbage. So let's go. Uh, where was carbology first pioneered as a academic discipline? Where was garbology first pioneered as an academic discipline? A, Bangor University, Wales. B, George Mason University, USA. C, University of Arizona, USA, or Garissa University, Kenya. Where was Garbology first pioneered as an academic discipline? I think Garbology is a really fun word to say. It's like Wombology from SpongeBob, so yeah, Garbology. Uh, yes, D does exist. All of these are real universities, so yeah. in case you think that I was gonna put in like a made up university to confuse you guys know, all of them are real universities and one of them is the answer. Uh, yes, you can just write the answers and then you can email it to us uh, right at the end. So just email when we've done the marking earlier. All right, let's go. Which of the following cities is the most garbage, garbage efficient one in the world? Which of the following cities is the most garbage efficient one in the world? Geneva, Switzerland. Copenhagen, Denmark, Stockholm, Sweden, Bergen, Norway. Which of the following cities is the most garbage efficient one in the world? I, I know garbage is a really nice word to say, but I said it so many times. Now when I say garbage, it sounds as if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Garbage, so yeah. So when they say most garbage efficient, right, it's kind of like, not just uh, they do recycling and reducing of it, but what they actually do with it later as well. So yeah. People don't seem to trust me. Well, I know. Okay, let's go. Three, which country first referred to its workers, refuse workers as garbologists in a humorous term trend where garbology became a term for waste management? Which country first re referred to its refuse workers as garbologists in a humorous trend where garbology became a term for waste management? Next, let's look at some uh, local stuff. What is Singapore's estimated domestic waste production per capita? What is Singapore's estimated domestic waste production per capita in 2019? So uh, for this one, right, uh, 
there was a range that I was going to tell you guys. So uh, the range is between one and 500 kilograms. And uh, if you get it within the 50 kg mark, we'll give you an extra point. Because we know you guys have extra points, so yeah. So it's between one and 500. And if you get it within 50, you will get full marks. Okay, let's go. Uh, approximately in SGD value, how much unconsumed food is thrown away each year by every Singaporean household? Approximately how much in SGD value is unconsumed food thrown away by each Singaporean household? Same thing, uh, we will have $50. $50? No. Uh, 50, yeah, $50 of stuff in the way. Yeah, see, the link says 200 million worth of food. We mean like every household. So yeah, unless you want to take 200 million and divide it by the number of households we have in Singapore. So yeah. Don't out us like that, Drettel. Like next, next time, private message me. <laughs> you, you shocked me there. I was like, is it there? Then I realized it's like 200 million entirely. But yeah, uh, it's by per household. So it's not as big as 200 million. Take a guess, take a guess. Yep. So as usual, uh, we'll give you $50 either side. Uh, if you get it on dot, we'll give you an extra point. So yeah. All right. Uh, let's move, let's move. Next, rhinology, the study of not rhinos, noses. So we thought we'll have a slightly chilled one where people don't need to like think as much. So can you down this, uh, narrow down this elephant species based on its nose? So they're like Who three knows? livings. Yeah, you, you've been waiting to lay that one, haven't you? Well done, <laughs> well done. <laughs> so there are three living species of elephants. So it's one of the living three. So yeah. So rhinology is the study of nose and nose related stuff. So yeah. Not rhinos. Rhinos. <laughs> Moving on. To whom does this big spacious nose belong to? To whom does this big spacious nose belong to? So what we got to do is uh, for this kind of questions where it's generic, right? You can just give us like a generic group or species and stuff. But if you get it like right, I mean, uh, yeah, family, if you get it right down to the species, we'll give an extra point. So yeah. So if let's say this is a macaw, like a scarlet macaw and you say macaw will give you half. So yeah, I don't think I'll give you anything for parrot. So yeah. It's quite pixelated, so you guys gonna lean back further. But to which baby does this nose and mouth belong to? To which baby does this nose and mouth belong to? Looks like the the nose has its own face. I know, like when, when I first found this picture, I was very like shocked. Yeah, so, Gretel yeah. said it too. It's like a face. It does. Like uh, when, when you guys see the picture, you'll know why it's quite horrifying. So yeah. But it, it's a real animal, you know, it's not like a chupacabra or something. Okay, this has got a lot of options. Which of these animal groups have at least one species with notably hairy noses? Which of these animal groups of animal groups have at least one species with notably hairy noses? A. Bear. B. Otter. C. Wombat. D. Bear and Otter. E. Otter and Wombat. F. Bear and Wombat. G. All of the above. H. None of the above. So essentially, which of these animals, animal or animals, have a member that has got a notably hairy nose? And if, if the audience are giving karma points to the host, right? Marcus came up with this question, not me. They don't already trust me, man. They don't trust me. So yeah, I'm gonna rack up some good karma points. It's all Marcus. So you all can take your issues with him. Right, moving on. Which animal is the owner of this big and shiny nose? Which animal is the owner of this big shiny nose?
All right. And moving on to C of GRC, cockles. Told you we're riding the wave. So let's get it on with cockles. What is the relationship between hearts and cockles? A, cockles are good for your heart. B, cockles resemble stylized hearts. C, cockles have a similar heart rate to us. Or D, cockle flesh resembles a human, the human heart. Which of the following is the reason for the relationship between hearts and cockles? Okay. Moving on. Which of the following is a true cockle of the family Cardi Day? Which of the following is a true cockle of the family Cardi Day? A, the blood cockle. B, the New Zealand cockle. Or C, they are both true cockles. Or D, they are both not true cockles. I hope this round warms the cockles of your heart. Speaking of cockles of your heart, what really are the cockles of your heart? Do we, are we refer, referring to the chambers, the aorta, the ventricles, or the pumping motion? What really are the cockles of one's heart? Chambers, aorta, ventricles, or pumping motion? Okay. Crafto says he likes the drawing. Yeah. All right, next one, next one. You're running out of time. Oh, yeah, let's go. What is the chemical compound or molecule responsible for the reddish color of the blood cockle? Anthocyanin, beta carotene, hemoglobin, or myoglobin? What is the chemical compound or molecule respons responsible for the reddish color of the blood cockle? Tegilarca granosa. Okay, and last one, the heart cockle, which is a real thing, uh, which can be found in Singapore's wild shores, is a hermaphrodite. True or false? The heart cockle, which can be found in Singapore's wild shores, is a hermaphrodite. True or false? All right, let's go through the answers. I'll give you guys a second to catch up. Yep, especially for those who are joining us for the first time, you will be marking your own answers and reporting it on the Google Live sheet at the end. Yep, oh, there we go. Oh, okay. So, uh, Garbology was first pioneered in the University of Arizona, USA. Garbology was first pioneered in University of Arizona, USA. I think, I believe it was in 1971. And Copenhagen, Denmark is one of the most garbage efficient cities in the world. Uh, the picture you see is actually their new uh, incinerator per se, and they use it to like, uh, it's, it's also a tourist attraction and they also use it to power up to 60% of the homes in the country. So they are one of the most garbage efficient ones in the world. Like, you know, the slope, right? When it snows, you can actually ski down it. And Australia was the first country to refer to its refuse workers as garbologists uh, at the point where garbology was like a fun word to use on like waste management systems. Australia is the answer for three. Question four, uh, 322 kg is the estimated number. Um, so if you get uh, 50 on either side, uh, we'll, you, can get, you can get a mark if you get 50 on either side. If you get 322 on the dot, you can get an extra mark. 322 kg. And question five, uh, average Singaporean household throws away $258 worth of food, unconsumed food every year. And again, uh, you get two marks if you get 258 on the dot. 
If not, if you get anything between 208 to 308, you will get just one point. Okay. And this nozzle belongs to the Asian elephant because Asian elephants only got one finger, while uh, African ones have got two. Both the African ones have got two fingers on the end of the nose. So this is the Asian elephant. And this is the turkey vulture. So if you got vulture, I'll give you like one point. Turkey vulture can get you two points. Okay, so turkey vulture. Yes, just take a moment, look at that face and be confused. That is a baby Sumatran rhinoceros. And that was the nose that I was showing you guys. I have no idea why its face looks like that. I know, I know it's the hairiest rhinoceros, but someone shaved its face or something, I guess. Yes, it is a nightmare. The things I go through to make up these quizzes is painful. Like, why? Just why? But yes, Sumatran rhino. So if you got Sumatran rhino, excellent. Of course, I wanted like the species name on it. So yeah. Uh, rhino, rhino. Hmm. What do you think, Marcus? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, full credit. Yeah, we'll give you full credit for rhino because it's such a horrible image. And we want to get it out <laughs> of the screen ASAP. And the answer is E, otter, and wombat. Because you get the hairy nose otter and the hairy nose wombat, who looks quite confused to be there. But yes, E, otter, and wombat is the right answer. You do not have any hairy nose bears. And speaking of bears, the koala is the owner of this big shiny nose, and it's also not a bear. So yeah. It's a drop bear. It's a drop bear, yeah. I, I hate koalas, man. They are like my least favorite animal. I'll tell you guys why, like, some of the time. Cockles. Answers for cockles. Um, cockles resembles stylized hearts. The whole cockle family does that. Hence their family name, Cardi Day, which is like heart. So cockles resemble stylized hearts. And they both are not true cockles. They are both actually clams. And the blood cockle, the uh, sea ham you get in your kway teow is actually not a cockle. It is a art clam. And the cockles of your heart are actually the ventricles. Uh, not sure why, but they are the cockles of your heart. So to warm them is to be happy and pleased. So yes. And hemoglobin, the same stuff that's in our blood, is the reason for the blood cockle's reddish color. So hemoglobin is the right answer for four. And five, it is true. The heart cockle uh, is a hermaphrodite. And they look like that. And they're all pink as well. Right. Right. So um, I request everyone to total up your scores and head over to uh, the live Google sheet to fill them up. And then we'll go on to the bonus round once everyone is ready. So please fill up your scores on the live Google Sheet. So after uh, today's trivia, we learned that the blood cockle is not a true cockle. So next time when you eat chakwetel, you can tell that to your favorite cockle. That, that is not a cockle. Or you can be really pedantic and say you don't want clams and they'll just look at you weird. So yeah. <laughs> can we have the answer for C to this one? C2, yeah. They both are not true cockles. Yeah, okay, so as we talk, uh, as people are filling up the uh, Google Live here, I'll go through the bonus round for everyone's benefit. So um, once you fill up your scores on the live Google Sheet, uh, it will automatically tally up your points. But what you have to do for the bonus round is that you wager your points. So how this works is that you can wager from a minimum of zero points uh, one point to make maximum of the number of points you have. So let's say you've got all the questions correct, it's 15 points, you can wager up to 15 points for the bonus round. And you gain the number of points you wager if you're correct, or you lose the number of points you wager if you're wrong. So if you're 15 points, you wager all 15 points. If you're wrong, you get zero points, right? But if you get correct, you get 15 plus 15, which is 30 points. So this is how you can catch up with um, everyone else, or you could actually end up squandering all your points. So please put in your wages on the live Google Sheet, please. 
And as always, only put what you have, right? Don't like put in like too many points that you do not have and lead to awkward situations. Awkward situations like this, where I'll keep mentioning it at every episode. So yeah. All right, I see at least uh, two teams waiting for three more teams to put on their wages before we go on. Two more teams, uh, LP and, oh, Snuffles. Well, we got a private message that Snuffles is not uh, putting it up. So, uh, just one more. Do we have your points, LP? Okay, we'll let LP uh, decide. Okay, so uh, Leah's asking, how do we calculate the wager? So once you get your total score, so let's, let's say your score is 11, you can wager from one point to 11 points. That's all, the score, all, all you have. And if you get the bonus question correct, you get 11 plus 11, let's say we wager it all. And, but if you get it wrong, you get you end up with zero points. So that's how we work. So put your wager onto the column that says wager. Right, so uh, any other problems you have? Yeah, let me know when everyone's in and then I'll just put the question up. Okay. Yeah. And, and for those of us, or those who are playing the first time, the bonus question comes from the talk. So obviously this question comes from Tai Chong's talk. So that's what we paid attention. All right, so we're ready. Let's go. So bonus round for bonus question even. Name five man-made uh, items found underwater during our virtual dive. And one bonus point for three items starting with B. So name us five items. Uh, and if you get three items that start with a B, you get one bonus point. So yeah. Then um, apologies, items <laughs> spelled wrongly if an extra M. Yep. It's not deliberate. <clears throat> okay, so write down your five human-made items and we'll go through the answers in a bit. Okay, I think most people should have their five items down. Uh, do you want to go through the answer, Kanan? Yeah, sure. Uh, Marcus, can you also drop the email address in the, in the chat? Because I think people need it. Oh, yes. Okay, so the five human-made items found underwater during our virtual drive, drive, dive, is we had bottles, boat batteries, bicycle wheels, mess tins, washing machines, umbrellas, tires, plastic bags, tubs, so if you've got any of these, uh, any of any, any five of these, you get a point. And if you got three of the B ones, which is bottles, boat batteries or batteries and bicycle wheels or bicycle tires, you get an extra point. And if you've got anything else that was not mentioned here, right? Just let us know in the chat. So yeah, just in case we missed something, but I think we, we should be good. Hopefully, uh, when you thought about these questions, all the images of marine trash uh, filled your head. Mm, uh, does yeah. bags plastic count? Yeah, let's get it. Yeah, we get we get into bags plastic. It starts with the B. You got us now. You got us now. But okay, I, I'm, so not gonna, you... I'm not. I'm not going to accept if you say brawly for umbrella. I'm not gonna take that. Yeah, go on, Marcus, sorry. Yeah, once you've got, uh, you've marked uh, your bonus question, you can go on and fill up your grand total 
uh, in the live Google Sheet too. Oh, I see REL's got 15 points. Oh, LP's leading with 20 points. So they got 19 plus one. Well done. Oh, did they get that extra point for the three Bs? Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Uh, LP seems to be the team to beat. Um, oh, I see seven clean Cs as the beneficiaries. I'm not going to jump the gun, but I'm not too sure if that is a Singapore-based group charity. Yeah, and you guys, uh, as usual, you can send a photo or text of your answers to sgstem.talktrivia at gmail.com. And um, you know where to update your scores at tinyurl.com slash sgstem dash trivia. And also, if you guys want to put in the dollar pot, these are the deeds for the dollar pot. But yeah, don't, don't disappear yet, right? Because we're going to have uh, announcements for next week's talk. And also a fun announcement about something that's going to happen tomorrow. So hang in there. How's it looking over there, Marcus? Uh, let's see. All right, it seems that the unofficial winner today is uh, LP for, with 20 points. Oh, nicely done. Congratulations, LP. Kind of like just drop us like your name there so we can like congratulate the people as, people as well if you want to. No yeah, pressure. We'll go through the answers. So uh, once we've, we've gone through, we've checked the emails uh, later this evening. Um, oh, but um, maybe we have to, we'll get in touch with you LP, LP regarding seven clean seas because we've stated that we, uh, we live, we're wishing to contribute that pot to local environmental charities and this doesn't seem to be one of it. So if you could uh, email us, um, pick a local environmental charity, Singapore-based ones, um, and we will we'll be in touch with you via email on this. Meanwhile, uh, please take over, Karnan. Okay, uh, so what's happening is tomorrow, uh, Marcus and I are putting up some of the SG STEM stuff on the Global Science Show. So if you guys are on Twitter, just hit up the Global Science Show on Twitter. Uh, I think our slot's at 9.20. So it's about 10 minutes. So we're just going to put up like SG STEM behind the scenes, how it was created. And, and we're going to have like a tiny like pseudo trivia based on the questions from today. So yeah, and then we'll be talking about that. And we're also going to be like kind of promoting it on like a slightly global scale. So we get more people joining us. So that's what's happening for tomorrow. And for next week's, not next week's, next session. Uh, so wait, wait. Uh, yeah, talk about the photo that's on there. So uh, yes, fun worry. fact is that Kanan and I have never met each other uh, all this while. And it was only, what was it, Monday? Monday yeah, it that Monday. we met over coffee uh, for the first time uh, to talk about more science from Evil Plan. So that's, that's the story behind the photo there. So tomorrow it's at 4.20 p.m. And yeah, because Marcus and I never met and we did this like entire SG STEM planning and running stuff, right? Entirely via Twitter and WhatsApp. So yay for social media and uh, social communication. Uh, tomorrow we are doing it at four from 4.20 to 4.30 p.m. Singapore time. So if you guys are on Twitter, then you can check it out. We'll be retweeting it from both our accounts. So follow us there as well. And uh, for next session, session 10, we have Anbu from Acres. So uh, I don't think she's here today. So Anbu will be talking about kind of the role of ACRES, uh, both on a local scale and what it does against and what they do for like illegal wildlife trade for the exotic species. And um, she has said may or, there may or may not be animals joining us in the talk. So fingers crossed for that. So that's happening next session, which is the uh, 30 June, July even, 30 July. And I think uh, the registry should be up tonight or tomorrow so you guys can start signing up then yep it should be live I have gone live at uh, 9 p.m so go ahead and sign up for that please yeah it's it's already up someone's someone's just signed up i'm going to email you guys are fast excellent well done so yeah uh, it's live so you guys can go and sign up at tinyurl.com slash sgstam 2020007030 okay so that is us for now uh, oh wait turn on your cameras so marcus can grab a wifi of all of us and um, yep, 